It's the anniversary month of my ordination. I brought my certificate in here um, for a reason, but it was March 18, 1990 at Calvary Baptist Church in Bellflower. And the reason I brought that in is when I was ordained, there was a young couple hanging out there. They had just gotten married, and that's Tim and Debbie Escobar. And they have stayed faithful to the Lord all these years. And it just so happened today that all of our music people are gone. El Salvador, and I don't know where Andrew maybe he wouldn't tell me. But uh, we needed some musical help. And guess who was kind enough to step in? That couple that was at my church 33 years ago, where I was ordained. And they've got a beautiful music package ready for us today. So we'll let them get their places. And we're going to start out singing How Great Thou Art. I apologize because our music people are gone. I didn't get the slide centered, but can you ignore that for today, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, at least you can read them. But uh, stand up and just enjoy this wonderful song service that the Escobar has put together for us. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Same here. We're all part of the choir today, so sing loud and proud. <laughs>
thank you that you are a wonderful great God. Lord, you control the heartbeats in our chest. Lord, you control the breath in our lungs. You made this glorious day for us to come and rejoice and celebrate the love you have for us. Lord, bless this day. Bless our time together, our fellowship. Bless the lives of each one of these individuals, Lord, and the families they have. Lord, you continue to share your love through us so that we can share your love to the world. Thank you for this day. Bless us as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat.
Let's get our bulletins out. One more song. Try and stay on one page. It's not as easy as it seems. First of all, fix your gaze over here. The reason why this podium is here today is not because someone was lazy and didn't put it away, but because we had that big wedding reception last night till late in the night out in the hall, we'll be doing our adult Bible study over here in the West Wing. So this is here because I will be here and you will be there at 12 noon in Tiendale. It's awesome. We are on the same page. And I want to congratulate you for your wonderful study that you're doing. Um, we're getting through it today, believe it or not, is lesson number four. Can you believe that? So, we have highlights from last Sunday's message. I hope that you will uh, look at this during the week and continue to track with us because we're going verse by verse for several weeks in the Gospel of John. And it's really hard to retain. I mean, we're hitting a lot of information very quickly. And so it's helpful if you can get back into the things that we studied last week and get ready each week as we move forward. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, is there anything else that I need to mention today? Wasn't Melissa's wedding beautiful? Yeah. We really honored the Lord by that wedding. Yeah. Day. She was wonderful. Okay, well, today is the last Sunday of the month, which means it's time for what? Easter. We're still on the same page. It's a miracle. All right, it certainly is time for Bean Smith uh, Wheelbarrow. And so this is for North Korea. And we have the Brother Act coming, Big Brother and Little Brother. Kevin, I'm transitioning. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, hi, guys. Lori's working on a new goal for our collection. We see that uh, 3000 isn't such a personal best per year. So she's going to find out what we've gotten together as an aggregate since we started this, which was, I think, back in 2017. And whatever we're closest to to rounding it off in the tens of thousands, we will, uh, we will make that our goal. How's that sound? And uh, do you think that, that we can make that goal? Do you feel confident that we can? Yes. Thank you, Chad. Yeah. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to dump mine in. Do you want to hold the mic so everybody can hear the beautiful noise? Once again, this is for what country, guys? North Korea. North Korea. You know what I call North Korea for short? No hope. Can you say no coke? No coke. Yeah, that stands for North Korea. All right, so uh, if you hold the microphone, they can hear my money come in. I'm very versatile. I have loud offering. Oh. I have soft offering. <laughs> right. So look at these two handsome guys. Don't you think... At least 300 in the wheelbarrow today. All right, try and make it a heavy load for Cody. He wants to show off his muscles today. All right, uh, as you feel ready, come on up and give to a Beans wheelbarrow.
the hour, every hour, of course. All right, I messed up. You ready? I
him touching me showing up in COVID time when we reopened, but for the newlyweds to show up to church the day after their wedding, that really touches me, doesn't it? <laughs> well, again, I'm a perfectionist, so you know, I'm really bothered that we didn't get the screen uh, the way we wanted it, but if we tried to do that, you'd still be waiting for church to start because it would have been on me. So um, just ignore it, pretend like it's centered, and then my perfectionist ways will be appeased. As long as you think it's centered, my perfectionist ways will be satisfied. How many think it's centered? Yeah. All right. Well, we began last week back in the Gospel of John. We do a little bit every year. Uh, most, most of the time, last year we diverted to the book of Revelation, as I said before. But it's interesting, John revealed seven of Jesus' miracles in the gospel. And the number in the Bible for completion is what? Seven. seven. So by the Holy Spirit's leading, John definitely had a plan, a very specific purpose for the seven that he revealed. As a matter of fact, he explained to himself at the end of the book saying, I couldn't write possibly everything that could be written about Jesus, but these things I have written. And he tells us why he chose such things as these seven particular miracles. He wrote these things not just so we could know what happened in the life of Jesus, but so that we could know who Jesus is and why it is necessary that we believe in him. Amen. So it's meant not just to be interesting to read, it is meant to be integral to read. Every single person living on planet Earth needs to know what John has revealed about Jesus. Why? These miracles attest to Jesus' identity as Messiah and the Son of God. And as his identity is revealed through these divine pages of John, what does that do for everybody who's living here that can read them? Well, it fortifies us as believers. It strengthens our faith, but it also has the power to lead unbelievers to faith in him. So again, this is so interesting uh, so much in here, but it's more than interesting, it's integral for the souls of men and women in the world. John's Gospel was the first book of the Bible that I read. I've told you that, you know that, but I still can't get over it. When you've been without a Bible for the first 17 years of your life, you never touched one. Then you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the person who led you to the Lord gives you a Bible, and you're holding it for the first time as a crazy, mixed-up teenager, and you go off to Sacramento to Boys State, and while you're having your free time, you sit in the dorm uh, at Sacramento State and, and read for the first time the Bible, and it's the Gospel of John. You never get over it, because doing that, going off to Boys State, and reading the Bible for the first time in this Gospel, it totally changed my life. Like I say, it can fortify believers or uh, it can lead unbelievers to Jesus. So being able to, as a brand new believer, believe what John wrote about Jesus, not only did it change my values and give me an inner peace that I never had before and took away my fear of death. Yes, even as a 17-year-old, I was fearful about dying. But it also not least in significance, by reading this gospel brought me into a vital relationship with Jesus. Amen. After reading this gospel, not only did I know him as my Savior, but I felt close to him. Amen. I felt like with my knowledge of him through this gospel, he was walking with me and talking with me in my daily existence. So here we are, the seventh miracle. And it is that of raising a man named Lazarus from the dead. And it constitutes, like I said already, the final and ultimate messianic sign of Jesus in John's Gospel. 
And the thing that we need to understand is in the New Testament, whenever you see the word miracle, it's the same Greek word translated sign. And so these miracles, again, were, of course, for the good of humanity, but that was not the main purpose. The main purpose for these miracles were to be signs, as we said here, uh, to show that Jesus indeed is the Messiah. And raising this man from the dead, who had been dead for four days, as John's final miracle, is obviously the ultimate messianic sign. So as we said last week, in this miracle, uh, what Jesus did in three ways was show uh, his um, unique authority and power. When you saw these miracles, there was no way that you could, if you were not hardening your heart, there's no way you could come to any other conclusion than that this is the Messiah, the Son of God. So last week we saw one of the ways that he demonstrated in this miracle his authority and his power was the circumstances for this miracle were prearranged by him. He prearranged all of these things. He prearranged it to involve the people that Jesus loved. Are you in John chapter 11? Turn there. How many are there? Raise your hand. I think I forgot to tell you to turn there. Okay, so uh, in, in him actually prearranging these circumstances uh, so it would be just the way he wanted it to be the ultimate sign, he happened to involve the people that he loved. Look at verses 3 through 5. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So here we see he knows everything that's going to happen. It's all prearranged, but it's prearranged for the people he loved. Look at verse 5. Let's read it out loud together. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Oh, Isn't that a precious verse? Yeah. Jesus loves us. There's a song out by um, Crowder. What's his first name? David. David Crowder. And the song is, He Really Loves Us. And that song I really love because it reminds me that this is the truth. Jesus really loves people. He loved uh, these three, this family, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he loves us. Amen? But he also prearranged it to defy the odds. Um, look at the circumstances that made this seem so unlikely and so daunting for this Jewish rabbi, as some would only know him to be. Look at verses 6 through 15. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, said he to his disciples, let us go unto Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? So there's the odd against him. He's got a bounty out on, on him. But he goes on to say in uh, the next few verses that as long as I am doing the work of the Father, I'm going to be saved. Uh, I, I will not be harmed while I am doing the will of the Father. And that's basically what those verses talk about. Uh, then, though, in verse number 11, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. He shall recover from his sickness. We're fishermen, we're not doctors, but we, know, we prescribe bed rest for Lazarus. Let him sleep. Howbeit Jesus speak, spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is what? Yeah. So here's another odd that he has to defy. He's, he's not making this easy. He says in verse 15, And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may what? Believe. Okay, so we see why John's including these things. 
these miracles so that we as believers can be fortified in our faith and unbelievers can come to a place of faith in him. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now put yourself in Jesus' sandals. Would you make these things that hard on you? But he did, right? He, he defied the odds. So the circumstances of this miracle were prearranged by him. That's one way he reveals his unique power and authority in this miracle. The second way is the outcome of this miracle was pledged by him. Amen. He promised to Martha that Lazarus was going to rise from the dead. The problem for Martha was that he had been dead for four days. So this is taking her into a new realm with the Savior um, to try and understand how this is going to work out with her brother being dead for days. So how is it that he could pledge this outcome, defying the odds? Well, because everything was under his authority. And this is what he wanted them to see. He was the Messiah and the Son of God. Though he was man from the lineage of David, he was in his divinity, God the Son, which means, if that's who I am, then I have authority over everything. And we see this not only in this miracle, but we see it in other miracles. Remember when that one man was paralyzed and they couldn't get him in the house uh, because of all the people around listening to Jesus, so they put him through the roof. Yeah. And Jesus told him when he saw this poor man who was paralyzed, he said, your sins are forgiven. Well, his antagonists, they protested and said, you blaspheme. You're saying his sins are forgiven. You're saying you're divine and you can forgive sin. Jesus said, okay, you want to go there? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and Amen. go to your house. So this, again, was showing Jesus' authority. He had the power to do what? Not only to raise, uh, not only to heal this man's uh, paralysis, uh, but to do what? Forgive. forgive sins. He had the power to forgive sins. Also, uh, when uh, he was on the boat on the Sea of Galilee with his, his disciples, a terrible storm came and he was sleeping and they all thought they were going to die and they woke him up and he said to the wind and the waves, he said, peace, be still. And it says after that, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. So Jesus showed that he had authority over everything. He had authority over the weather. He had authority over man's sin and guilt. And he's going to show this time once again, this is the ultimate. He's going to raise a man from the dead who had been dead for four days. Now, he had to give this pledge in rebuttal to Martha's musings. She was trying to think all this out. She was trying to rationalize all of this. And she needed to be straightened out in her understanding of Jesus's authority. So let's get back to the narrative. Let's look at verse 20, uh, uh, 20 uh, 17, excuse me. So four days had passed. And when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, two miles. And consequently, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. This family must have been pretty prominent because the elitist crowd was coming from Jerusalem to help her mourn 
So she had connections. She's a significant uh, Martha and Mary, their significant uh, Lazarus, their significant family. Then Martha, as soon as she, verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. And this is her musings. Look at verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, this was not a rebuke to Jesus. This was a testimony of her trust in its healing power. What she was just saying was, Lord, hypothetically speaking, had you been here because we know of your healing power, you could have cured him from his illness and he wouldn't have died. A lot of people think that at this point, Martha is rebuking Jesus, but we know from the geography that that's not the case from the geography and the situation of four days. Um, they're, in Beth they're in Bethany, right? Jesus had left Jerusalem because they wanted to kill him. We saw Thomas say that. If we go back there, we're going to die. So where did he go? He went up to this area of Korea, beyond the Jordan River, where John used to baptize. So when they sent the messenger, it took him one day to get to Jesus. After Jesus got the message, he stayed here two days, and then he went to Bethany. So one day here, two days waiting, one day back. One plus two plus one equals four, right? Yep. So what does this mean? This means by the time that servant got to uh, Jesus, Lazarus had already died. Because oh. it took him one day to get there. It took Jesus two days not to do anything and one day to get back. That was the four days that Lazarus had been dead. Most likely, Lazarus had already died before the messenger came to Jesus. And he said, Lazarus sleeps. Lazarus is dead. That's what he told them. Um, so what she's trying to do is basically she knows Jesus loves Lazarus. She's trying to commiserate with him and encourage him. Oh Lord, I know you're 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 probably you know very very sad about this, and, but feel better about this. If you would have been here, he would you could have healed him because that's who you are. You could have done that. Um, so this is her musings. And now she says in verse 22, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Amen. She was not saying at this point, listen to this, she was not saying that she believed Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead. How do we know that? Well, look at verse 39. She wasn't believing at that point that Jesus could raise him from the dead because at verse 39, when Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha said, Martha the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he what? Stinks, for he has been dead for how long? Four days. Four days. He's saying, Lord, we don't want to do this. It's going to be gross. So she wasn't believing again. This was a statement to encourage him. Uh, they were all mourning. She's trying to, you know, comfort Jesus that someone he loved very much, Lazarus, had died and he wasn't there to stop it from happening. So when she says in verse number 22, but I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it me, she knew he had a special relationship to God so that his prayers could bring some good from this sad event. So, okay, Jesus, uh, you have so much power with God. You're here now, and because of your power of prayer, you can make things better for us. So we're so glad you're here now. That's kind of Martha's musings. Well, that leads him to not only show that he had authority over everything, but now we transition to this very specific authority that he had. He could pledge this outcome because he had power over death. Back to Martha's musings in verse 24. Martha said unto him, Lord, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection when? At the last day. She's thinking into the future. Once again, everything she said before. 
was just to comfort Jesus. It was not a review. It was not a belief that he was going to raise Lazarus. We saw that from verse 39. She now, though, is saying, hey, let's look to the future. We know that last day is coming, and when that last day comes, he, what's going to happen with my brother? He's going to rise from the dead, right? So being Martha brought it up, blame it on Martha, we've got to get a little eschatological this morning and talk about this matter of the last day. Being Martha brought it up. So if I lose any of you, don't blame it on Pastor Tom, blame it on Martha. When you get home, you just say, oh, Martha. All right? But we've got to talk about this. This is so important. Do you know uh, this term? Look at it here in verse number 24, the last day. Do you know this term is only found in the Bible in the Gospel of John? You won't find that term relating to prophecy, the last day, anywhere but in the Gospel of John. Amen. So what is this last day that Martha is referring to and looking forward to that is her hope, that that's when Lazarus is going to rise from the dead? What is the last day and when is this last day that she is talking about? Well, we can get a good idea of this by looking at the verses where the wording is found, and again, it's found only in what book? John. The Gospel of John. So we can just stay there, but let's go back to where it begins being stated, and it begins being stated by Jesus himself. Remember, Jesus had already been with Mary and Martha, and he probably had taught them about this last day. So let's see what Jesus says about it. Uh, look at verse number 39 of John chapter 6. <clears throat> By the way, First Lady's filling in for Janine on the slides. Isn't she doing a great job? <laughs> Way to go, First Lady. All right, verse 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again. What's that preposition? At the last day. Now go on over to verse number 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. Preposition? At the last day. Now let's go to uh, verse number 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up, preposition, at the last day. So Jesus had taught this. Go back to John chapter 11, and verse 24. And this is Martha's hope at this point. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again, in the resurrection at the last day. The last day is mentioned only one more time, and it's in John chapter 12. And all of a sudden, this is what helps us to really understand uh, what might be meant by the last day and when the last day is. In John chapter 12 and verse 48. Jesus says, it's the last time this term is used in the Bible, he that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him. Different proposition, not at, but what? In the last day. So this helps us to understand. Every other time the preposition is at the last day, there will be a resurrection. At the last day, there will be a resurrection. But in the last day, there will be, according to Jesus' teaching in verse 48, there will be judgment. Amen. Look at it one more time. Blame it on Martha. I'm getting into this. Follow me. Okay, look at it again. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one. What's the word? Not resurrection, but what? Yeah. Judgment. Judges him. 
The word that I have spoken, the same shall, not talking about resurrection, shall do what? Judge him in the last day. So, from the prepositions given to us of the Holy Spirit, we know that at the moment of the last day, there is resurrection. At the moment of the last day. And in the last day, there is judgment. judgment. Wow. Just paying attention to the prepositions. So if I call you up and I say to you, you say, where are you? And I say, I'm at the ocean. You probably think that I'm standing near the beach. But if you call me up and you say, where are, are you? And I say, I'm in the ocean. You say, what are you in the ocean with your cell phone for? You're going to ruin it. But there's a little difference between being at and in. Being at means you're close to, or right at, I'm right at, but being in means you're in. So what does this tell us? If we, uh, if we look, we will see that the last day is not a single day. No. It doesn't happen at the very end of the world that there's this resurrection and judgment at once. It's a time period that begins with the resurrection of believers, which is the rapture, and extends into a period of time when God judges unbelievers. All right? So before God judges the world of unbelievers, he does that great air rescue, and that great air rescue, the rapture, involves another R word, resurrection. Okay? So... The rapture comes, that is the beginning, the starting of the last day, and then the last day proceeds over a period of time for the rest of time when we're out of here, and what is God doing to the people in the world? Judge. Judging them when? In the last day. So, a synonymous, synonymous term in the Bible, like I say, this is only found in the Gospel of John, a synonymous term everywhere else in the Bible is the last day is the same thing as the day of the Lord. Amen. What precedes the day of the Lord? Resurrection and rapture. What happens after resurrection and rapture? The day of the Lord, a period of time that extends where God judges unbelievers, just like Jesus said, look at it again, verse 48, he that rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him, well, when will that happen? The word I have spoken, the same shall judge him, when will that happen? When? In the last day. Not at the last day, at the last day, at the last day at the beginning is when God delivers his own. In the last day, he judges. So what is the last day? The last day is the same thing as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is judgment. We see how this works. If you look at Isaiah 34, 8 on the screen, God equates the day of the Lord involving two things. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the day, but it is also the what? Year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So the day of the Lord is not a single day. The last day is not a single day. It is a day that projects to at least how much time? A year. A year. It's not a literal single day. So thank you, Martha. I'm so glad to share this with my peeps. The timing of, the, of this day is given as a day and a year. In other references, if you're taking notes, Isaiah 61, 2, Isaiah 63, 4. This year-long day of the Lord is probably what Jesus and Martha were referencing when he spoke of the last day. So, Jesus had to correct Martha's musings, and he does this in two of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Let's go back to John chapter 11. And verses 25 through 26, Jesus said unto her, to correct her, her rationalizing, Jesus said unto her, we don't have to look forward to the last day. Because guess what? 
I am presently the resurrection and the life. He that is believing in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Wow. What does John MacArthur say about verse 25 when Jesus gets Martha all straightened out about who he is and what he can do? John MacArthur says with this statement, Jesus moved Martha from a general affirmation of the resurrection that will take place in the last day to a personalized trust in him who alone can raise the dead. No resurrection or eternal life exists outside of the Son of God. And here's our little explanation to Martha. Time at the last day is no longer, is, is no barrier to the one who has the power of resurrection and life, or he can give life when? Anytime. Anytime. So imagine this. Martha's talking about the last day, not wanting the stone to be rolled away because he speaks up. She thought Jesus just wanted to see him one more time. No, Jesus, don't go there. All right? And now he's saying, <laughs> Martha, this is going to be solved right now because of who I am. I am the resurrection. Not I will be. I am right now the resurrection and the life. All life is in my control, in my power, in my authority. And I... Jesus Christ can determine who lives and dies at any given minute. And if someone dies, if I want him to live, he can live again. That's our Jesus. Amen. Verse 26. Icing on the cake. And whosoever is the one living and believing in me shall never die. Now, Martha, do you believe thou this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And yes, if you believe that, then the resurrection of your brother comes with that. It's all in one package, Martha. You believe that I am the Christ, the Son of God, that I am the promised Messiah from the line of David, but the pre-existent Son of God, becoming man in the line of David, you believe that? And with that package comes today the resurrection of your brother, Amen. even Amen. though he stinketh. Amen. My goodness. Lives here in verse number 26. Lives, excuse me, in verse 26. Whoever lives refers to those who have spiritual life now. Those who believe uh, shall never die and that they ultimately triumph over death. Whether Jesus wants to do it presently or when at the last day. The rapture, right? Mm -hmm. So, I want to wrap up today and tell you how meaningful this verse is. Not only the first time I ever read it, but one other time when I heard it. Um, there's this young man, that's, his picture's up on the screen right now. Timothy Watkins. And uh, there was an Associated Press article concerning this dear young man. It read, an army specialist from this Southern California desert town was among five soldiers killed by a powerful roadside bomb that shredded their heavily armored Bradley fighting vehicle during a recent operation in Iraq, military officials said. Uh, man, I'm ha I've, I've had a busy weekend. I'm drawing a blank. I've got to refer to my friend here, Tim. SPC Specialist. Specialist, thank you. Specialist Timothy Watkins, 24, died October 15th while participating in a combat mission in Ramadi, a mostly Sunni Arab city about 70 miles west of Baghdad, the military announced Tuesday. He and the other soldiers had been assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 69th Armor Regiment, 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division in Fort Binnings, Georgia. In August, Watkins spent two weeks at his parents' home after serving for seven months in Iraq, said his father, Rob Watkins. His father, Rob Watkins, is my friend. He's a pastoral colleague. 
and his son died suddenly in Iraq. He had just been home with them. He had already served. How long had it been? Uh, seven months. He went back and he died. Oh my and I've, I've known this, this pastor for years. Uh, this is he right here. He spoke at our church before. That's me looking quite younger. <laughs> but I'm still as buff. That hasn't changed. <laughs> and there's his dear family. And there's the heartbroken mother. And we gave them a flag that flew over uh, uh, the ship in Pearl Harbor in memory of their son. But I was so heartbroken, so shocked to hear about Tim Watkins dying in Iraq, that when the funeral happened, uh, my assistant Ron Glover and I, we drove all the way to Yucca Valley to his funeral. And his dad preached his son's funeral. There were so many people we couldn't even get in, in, in the church uh, auditorium. We stood outside and listened to his dad, his heartbroken dad, losing his boy, his 24-year-old boy, senselessly in that roadside bombing, that uh, IED. Is that right? Glad Tim's here today. And, and Glenn. And uh, guess what verse he used to preach his own son's funeral? John 11.25. And he pointed out to us some of the very things that we have indulged ourselves in joyfully today about our Jesus and about the hope that um, we all have to see Tim again. And so like, what do you preach when your 24-year-old son gets killed by a roadside bomb? What do you preach for your kids to hear, for your wife to hear, for your church to hear, for your colleagues to preach. What do you preach? John 11, 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. And what Jesus was showing again, just what John wanted to do, please stand with me, is he was showing that he is the fulfillment of Psalm 49.15. Let's read that all out, out loud together. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. All right? Who redeemed Lazarus from the power of the grave? Jesus. Jesus. So, who's the only one who can do that? But, but God. Jesus was showing in this ultimate miracle in John's Gospel, the seventh one, John was using this miracle to show that Jesus is whom? God. Because by raising him from the dead after four days, it showed that God redeemed Lazarus' soul from the power of the grave. Amen. So this is our Jesus. And this is why we stick with the stuff. We keep preaching, Brother Tim, even when COVID lockdown, we open up because there's no more important message for anybody on the earth to hear than John 11:25. Amen. Because it happened to my friend Rob Watkins, and it's going to happen to all of us if we live long enough. There's going to come that phone call in our lives where there's going to be the death, the unexpected death of someone we love so dearly that we will literally fall to the ground in shock and horror and sadness. We will lose our bearings. That will happen to us if we live long enough. A tragic death. But we have what Rob Watkins has. We have John 11, 25. And so let's bow our heads and just rejoice in our Lord. Because he can keep you from dying as long as he wants you to live on this earth. But if he allows you to die... Just before the day of the Lord, just before his wrath, at the last day, there will be a what? Resurrection. There will be the rapture. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we praise you and thank you that your word is so full. It takes so much time to cut out what we want to say as we approach the Gospel of John. We're just like John. He could have wrote so many other things 
So many other things could be said today, but suffice it, Lord, as we've asked you to guide us and lead us, that we got to celebrate your son today. And we praise you that he is your son and that he is our Savior. And we ask for everybody, everybody who is hurting right now uh, over the loss of loved ones, that you'll just cheer them today by the remembrance, Jesus, that you have absolute power and absolute control over everything that is created, and that you have an eternal plan for us, Lord. So we praise you that your word changes us. It takes away our fear of death. It realigns our values. It gives us an inner peace that we never experienced before. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Son. We praise you, Holy Spirit, that your word changes us for the good. We also ask, Lord, that you have your hand upon our dear newlyweds, Melissa and Norman. We thank you so much that they've joined us in the fellowship today. And Lord, we pray that you give special blessings to Tim and Tebby, Debbie Escobar, who have been so kind to come alongside us today, Lord, and bring this very special worship to your house. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, you'll need to turn to page 87. We don't have this one on the slide. Tim will lead you in a departing song.